is thank you all for coming to the Middle Class Values Town Hall. Um, I am Senator Larson, and I'm going to be passing the mic as, as you may have noticed that there's not amplification, but it is for the camera, um, and this will be broadcast on public television. Um, what we're going to do, just so everybody knows the format, we'll do introductions for everybody, and then we'll answer any questions um, and hear from you about some of the issues that you're hearing coming up and be able to address those, talk about what's going on at the Capitol. Um, and to be clear, you know, it's open to the public, open to everybody in contrast to um, what the governor's been doing with closed and invite only during business hour crowds. Um, so we want to make sure that we're able to hear from everybody, hear everybody's concerns, and make sure that people know that they can be heard um, back in the Capitol. So that will pass it to Good evening. <clears throat> I'm John Lehman from Racine. I represent uh, parts of Racine and Kenosha County. Most recently in the legislature in the fall, I was a member of uh, Senator Cullen's Committee on Mining, and I'm on the Mining Committee right now. This is a big week for the mining bill. Those of you watching the news, so if you have any questions or comments on mining, we'd be happy to hear those. We'll be probably seeing that mining bill uh, on Wednesday for uh, the Senate debate and vote. I'm a ranking member of the Education Committee, former teacher, um, so if you want to talk education, I'm very happy to uh, talk educational issues. I was at a forum this morning, 7 o'clock in Burlington, and the forum was essentially taken over by a discussion of the voucher proposals in the governor's budget. Uh, it was a Chamber of Commerce breakfast, but that's uh, highly interesting to a lot of people in the Burlington area. Uh, but anyway, whatever you want to talk about, we're, we're here uh, to listen as well as talk. Good evening, I'm uh, Representative Mandela Barnes, representing the northeast corner of the city of Milwaukee and the southern half of Glendale. A uh, big part of the, the budget that concerns me, a lot of people in my area are uh, some of them aren't even fiscal items. They're the, the Easter eggs that are inside of the budget, like the residency. Uh, a lot of people in my area are uh, police, firefighters who, who are on the edge of the city, and a, a lot of their neighbors enjoy having them around, uh, as, as we all do. It's uh, important for our tax base. It's important for our neighborhood quality. But uh, bigger issues are the uh, education funding. Uh, wasn't a teacher. I was, my, my mother was a teacher, and I graduated from public schools in Milwaukee. And, well, what's going on with our public school system that really, really affects me. I'm very passionate about the issue. I serve on the Urban Education Committee. Um, we're, we're looking to, to, to continue to put more money into a, a voucher program that hasn't shown the results that, uh, that I warrant us putting more dollars into it. So that's one of the, the, the biggest issues that, I'm, that I, I want to take out and uh, work on on this budget. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Miller. I'm a state senator from Bain County. Uh, before serving in the state senate, I was in the assembly and then before that in, uh, as a county supervisor. Um, uh, before running for elected office, I was a, um, a small businessman in real estate and a military pilot at the Wisconsin National Guard. Now I've had people come up to me in my office and say, well as a former small business person and as a 30 year member of the military, how come you're a Democrat? as though, you know, Democrats don't, aren't patriotic or whatever. I just say, well, I, you know, I believe in doing what's best for my community and for my state. And that's why I'm a Democrat. Uh, the, and if you actually, and it made me think a little bit about it, what is it about the military? Is in there, you're fighting for each other. You are, you've got your neighbor's back. You've got your, your, your comrade's back. And that's what we should be as a society. We should be working for the mutual benefit of all of us, and that that's why I'm a Democrat. So I'm glad you're all here, and I look forward to having an ex uh, exchange of views. And, uh, and here is my state representative. <laughs> my name is Melissa Sargent, and I'm one of the new 14 Democrats in the State Assembly. 14, I, that's a great number. <laughs> <laughs> I think we heard something about 14. Yeah. So the county board supervisor in Dane County, and I am a small business owner, and I am the mother of four children. 
and many people question how it is that I can find the time and energy to be doing this. And it, it's actually because of my children, it is because I'm a business owner that I decided to run for the state assembly. I think it's really important, um, as has been mentioned by many of my colleagues up here today, that we offer a voice for the everyday people of Wisconsin. And we offer some hope. Um, and that is why we are here today. Um, I was, I think, the only one of the people at these, these tables that was um, invited to a talk with Walker. And it was three levels of security for even me as an elected official to get in to sit down at a talk with Walker. And we want to be accessible to everyone across the state of Wisconsin as we move forward to make sure that we are fighting for the values of the people that are here rather than the special interest dollars that seem to be pouring into our state. So I'm really glad to, to be able to be here and answer any questions that folks have. There we are. And I uh, suppose I should further introduce um, uh, Chris Larson, represent the 7th Senate District, which if you've been to Summerfest, um, that's at the heart of my district, goes up to UW Milwaukee and then south to uh, Oak Creek and then everything in between. Um, was elected two years ago and have the privilege of serving as the Senate um, Democratic leader. Um, so, and the um, and we started these tours, I want to say it was two weeks ago now. And in that time, we have this will be stop number five. Uh, so, this will be our fifth town hall. Um, we've been through. Uh, we hit Sheboygan, Chippewa Falls, Wausau, Platteville, and now you know, here in Sheboygan. Um, so hitting, um, and we'll continue to do these and uh, try and hit every part of the state and make sure people can be heard. Um, so as you've heard, you've got um, uh, five great representatives, well four and me, um, of people who are very interested in, in hearing from you and willing to answer questions and, and uh, talk about the issues, but the most important thing is what's important to you and what uh, are you seeing, whether it's the budget or things that are happening in your community that you're hearing and concerned about, um, just making sure that, that you have your voice heard. So with that, I want to open it up to the audience. And we'll have, um, we can move the mic up to you, yeah, to what you have. Shannon can do that. I just well, want to make sure that I can wake it up. For the, yeah, the brief camera. Brief the question. Yeah. So Shannon can see what comes. Well, we'll repeat the question. This guy's done it before. I will right, repeat the question. So the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Let me start. Yes. Um, there, was a, there was a piece in the memo, Carol Times newspaper, this past weekend by the retiring superintendent of public schools there, who uh, maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, but. And I'm sure he can echo a lot of you here over in the state about, oh, absolutely, like, you know, bludgeoned and bled, bled with the public school stuff. Yeah. And um, that after the huge cuts last time, and it may have been as well, of course, you know that, you know, the, the Walker's going around saying that he's, he's destroying money in public schools. Well, it's, it's it, you know, it's just an echo and dying. I mean, they're not gaining anything. And uh, there really is tre tre tremendous fear on people who work in that, that school system. I'm not a teacher, but uh, uh, I know teachers. There's real fear about the welfare system. And um, I'm not exactly sure why, why supporting public schools, especially, or private schools, especially religious schools, is so important. Even somehow. Walker in, in, in you know in this budget now is really institutionalizing a very right wing Tea Party agenda. I mean he's building it right in actually, right into the into the into the financing, into the into the structure of these public institutions. What what do you know about Mike Ellis and the and the, and, and the other the, the Republican senators in the in your in your in, in the Senate? Uh, are you gonna be able to put together some kind of So did you, were you able to pick up any of the stuff? Yeah? Okay. You need, to, you need to repeat it? No, 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 for <laughs> us. To summarize, exactly, yeah, no, Mark, will, Mark will force me to do it. Um, 
No, that's, uh, I mean, the, to summarize the worry is about public education funding and about the expansion of um, publicly or taxpayer funded vouchers for private education, specifically for religious ed, and then um, where we're at in terms of where Republicans are responding to that, correct? Um, well, we happen to have our lead, who happened to be chair of education, um, previous sessions, and he was a high school teacher for um, teen years. So if, you, if you've been paying attention to the voucher proposal, it's school districts with over 4,000 kids, and two um, schools that got, that got a lower rating, um, and, that, and that comes out to nine districts around the state. We've had a little experience in Racine because the voucher program was moved from Milwaukee in, in the last budget into to Racine. Um, I, I would encourage anybody to follow the Kenosha news on this. Kenosha is one of these new communities and the superintendent of schools is out there just saying, why are you doing this? We have all kinds of choices for our kids within, the, within our system. We don't need that. We had a school board member who was in the press who said, um, philosophically, I, I'm strongly in favor of choices, and I may be in certain circumstances in favor of, of vouchers, but in this case, in Kenosha, this was just put on this community by formula without local folks asking for it, and you see two real financial challenges. One is, if you have young people moving from the public schools to those private schools uh, taking voucher money, that's a, that's a cost under our current funding formula, which is pupil-based. In addition to that, the, if you watch the history of Milwaukee and Racine, the school, the school districts themselves are asked to participate in the funding of those voucher schools. So as the superintendent of the Burlington district said this morning, you got these two groups. You got kids maybe leaving us, but then you got those kids that are attending the private and parochial schools in the Burlington area, and then they want to be funded. You know, so all of a sudden you're picking up more individuals in that public system, draining more dollars, m more total educational dollars from the 870,000 kids that are in the public system. Right now there's about 25,000 voucher kids. That's where the money's going and 870,000 public school kids, which are capped. As, of, as the budget stands right now, you can have no increases in the budgets. All education dollars will be going into tax relief, not one more pencil in a classroom, not one more dollar for a teacher's salary, no help whatsoever. So it's a very challenging thing. This morning, Representative Voss, the Speaker of the Assembly, and I were at this forum, and he's talking about he wants to see vouchers all over the state. And um, there is not support for that. He's, they're going to run into problems with uh, Luther Olson and uh, Mike Ellis, who have both publicly said, we, if you're going to do this to a community, at very least have a referendum on it so you can see what's, what's going to happen with it. Um, but. The whole idea of a couple failing schools driving a new dual system throughout a school district, you know, you got, because that voucher isn't just opened up to the kids in the failing schools, and it's obviously not just opened up to poor kids, like the vouchers, you know, the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program started out as a, a program for poor children to have equal choices in the schools. Well, what you've got with this, with the governor's proposal is it's fruit basket upset all of a sudden in the entire district. And for example, in Racine, we've got, I think it's 40 kids going to Shoreland Lutheran in Kenosha County being subsidized by Racine Unified under the voucher program. Mm -hmm. So you've got an open enrollment, you, these kids can go kind of where they want to and, and you start giving all these kids vouchers and many of those kids had previously attended that school and their parents dug deep and paid the tuition. And now the taxpayers are, are picking that up. And the taxpayers don't have the eagle eye of a school board. There, you, you know, it's a, it's a dual accountability system. You got all the rules and regs and, and the school boards on the one side, mm -hmm. and then you got this other second system being developed under the voucher system. So to 
just from a pure public policy, what's the best way to watch our dollars? We're losing on this one if it, if it goes through and if it gets expanded. And we, I think none of us can for sure speak for Mike Ellis and Luther Olson, but they've been out in public. Generally, when a legislature comes out in public and says, this is what I'm gonna stand for, at that, they generally stick with their guns. So we'll see how they do, but. The Democrats are all on the same page. The Democrats are pretty much on the same page. So, and that's um, where, the, where the three of us go in the Senate. Um, on any vote, if the Democrats all stay together, we need, we need two Republican senators yeah. to get up to 17 to 16 in a vote. Yeah. So hearing from um, Ellis and Olson both mm -hmm. with reservations is a real good sign. Uh, I, you know, they're, they're gonna have to either work those two guys really hard or, or we're gonna have to, we're, or we're gonna see a change in that budget. And uh, a lot of policy in this budget, a lot of ideas that aren't purely financial ideas. You know, they're, they're really, this is, we wanna do things differently. Um, and the Democrats have been criticized for that over a long period of years, but it's, it's defin definitely a huge change in how we do public education. If you go to this, this these new districts, and especially if, if uh, Representative Voss would get his way and expand it beyond that. Yeah. And there's, um, and you know Sheboygan is one of those nine new yeah. parts of the state. So did you know you're in a failing school district? So we're in, yeah, well, we're in Sheboygan, and that, that suddenly was included uh, last Sunday. And yeah. Surprise. Surprise. Yeah. 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 Just, just found out that they're suddenly in a, uh, in a failing school district. Can I ask a question to follow up on that? Uh, yeah, for sure. separation of church and state, which apparently means nothing anymore. Yeah. Nothing. Not for them. Um, it seems pretty blatant to me that it's a conflict of separation yeah. of church, at least for the private schools that are religious. I, right. I don't know about some of the online ones or not, but right. what about legal recourse? Right. Well, this is something that was um, that was by the state Supreme Court. Um, I wasn't, Marks, can you speak to that? Uh, not really, but it had been litigated and the, and, the, uh, and the Supreme Court said that the way it was structured that it didn't violate the separation of church and state provisions of the U.S. Constitution. So that's not, a, that's been something that's already been litigated. You know, and I can't tell you if it was if the litigation was based on the Wisconsin Constitution or the federal Constitution. I was I was always assuming that it was the federal Constitution because that's the one where the separation of church and state is. We talk about it the most. It's that you know we can't establish religion, and so therefore funding of a religious schools. But as long as the education is not religious education, then it's okay. As long as the children are allowed to opt out of religious classes, you know, ninety percent of what happens in private parochial schools is, you know, English, history, math, by, uh, you know, it's, it's the same. So uh, as long as you're not using those dollars to indoctrinate kids, I think the courts have said, yeah, this is permissible. Yeah. I mean, it's your, your, you know, it is a, it is an issue and, and it's open to interpretation. Um, I'm not familiar with the exact details, but I think it was a pretty close split decision on whether public dollars could be going to fund religious education or not. Um, so yeah, it's 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 something where there is a lot of a lot of questions um, surrounding it. Um, I think one thing I'd add to what Senator Lehman was saying is that to punctuate the twenty five thousand voucher students is that if it was broken out from the rest of the system, the voucher system as a separate school district would be the third largest school district in the entire state. And that's currently that's before this huge expansion. Um, to be clear about the differences between our community-based public education um, that was cut to historic levels in the last budget and got a 0% increase. Um, you know, you're hearing that there's money
put into it. It, it there's not a penny that goes back into classrooms. Um, and so it's a zero percent, it's still at that historic low, but at the same time, voucher schools are being increased by 9% for K-12 and 22% for high schools. Um, so they're seeing an increased level where there's this difference in, in uh, accountability, as Senator Lehman mentioned, and now there's a difference in, in the funding. So I, I do think that Senator Ellis has concerns, I do think that Senator Olson also has concerns, um, and we'll see. I think the governor dared, in, in if anyone else wants to speak on it, I think the governor really dared the Republicans to stand up to him on this one by putting such a huge policy discussion into the budget and putting this policy in there and knowing that it was unpopular with many even Republicans who don't like this um, to say, well, are you going to pull it out or are you going to go along with it? So it'll be interesting to see uh, what ends up happening. Um, and I think, again, it's a main reason why we're, we're here make sure that, that people are aware of these key differences in it. In the so I mean, I think there'll be no, I mean, you can just speculate whether there'll be no part of the yeah. uh, with, with the school system here, I mean, there's going to be some real objection to, to, to the whole voucher thing here. Yeah. Uh, what, what's that going to do to individual, individual centers like that? Well, I think it's, I think, Asking um, what the impact will be to individual senators and individual representatives. It's, it's a matter, you'd be surprised how little we hear from people all that often. Um, and I think contacting your elected um, soon. I mean, it, people end up saying, oh yeah, sure, I'm sure they know what I'm thinking. You know, but you'd be surprised if, if people aren't contacting them and letting them know this is what I this is what I think about this specific proposal or this specific plan and how it would impact me if you have a personal story. I mean, that gets paid attention yeah. to. That gets paid attention to. That absolutely gets paid attention to. The key point uh, on vouchers is to remind Joe Levin about the cost to the, re to the taxpayer who's yeah. continued to send their kids to the public schools. And, uh, you know, that, is, that kind of argument is, is um, often heard very well on the Republican side. They're very tax conscious, you know, and, and they talk about that a lot. But when, you, when you're starting to get, bringing more young people into a system, and the regular taxpayer that's been paying for a pub, public schools is now asked to pay for that system plus part of another one, uh, gives people pause. And uh, that's something we have to make sure that everybody knows uh, before that budget is passed. Yeah. There's been any, anybody else? We have. No, yeah. I just wanted to add a little bit. I'm a proud graduate of the public schools in Madison and I have small children. Three of them are currently in the public schools and one is yet to come in. And since this was announced by the governor, it has been one of the things that I have heard the most from my constituents about since the beginning of this session. And it is stunning to me that people are pointing out that Madison is one of these failing districts. And I hear over and over again about what a quality educational system that we have, a public school system that we have in Madison, and how it's inclusive, and it provides a quality education for children of all different needs and all different backgrounds, and we do not turn people away. And what's gonna happen with this voucher school plan, if it goes through, is it's gonna be total unaccountable, un unaccountability. Mm -hmm. And yeah. children are gonna fall through the cracks. And we will have children that are failing with the voucher schools, as well as our tax dollars being used in egregious ways. And it is very important that whether your representative agrees with you or not, that you be reaching out to them and reminding them, them, if you come from one of these school districts that is quote unquote failing, you let them know all the positive, fabulous things that are happening there for your children and the other children in your community because they are not failing. Public teachers do not turn children away. Mm -hmm. They work very hard. And it's amazing when people find out that their school district is one that is pegged as a failing district when they have a lot to feel proud of. And we need to continue to remind people about the value of public education. If we were funding our public education in an adequate manner, I mean, just look at that chart over there. It's, it's, it's astonishing. Um, we would not be having this conversation. We would not be needing um, private voucher schools in our communities. Yeah, that chart is a very dramatic chart, and you know, and the point is, is the governor has said he's adding more money to public schools, but none of it's going to the classroom. Which is, yeah, it's not helping the kids at all. It has to do with testing, you know, with websites and that sort of thing. 
Yeah, we're not even at levels we were 20 years ago. Uh, if you look at this chart, where we were in 93 and 94 to where we are today, it's just a significant dropping out. To Melissa's, or excuse me, Representative Sargent's point, is what, what do you consider a failing district anyway? And with the voucher school experiment in Milwaukee, there, have, there haven't been transformative outcomes that, we, that they use as examples. There haven't been failing students that have gone to voucher schools all of a sudden come out renewed and it, you know, just 4.0 scholars, scholars or anything. So it's, it's also in, in an experimental phase and we're, we're funding an experiment that hasn't any, uh, and in 20 years hasn't proved any uh, positive results that, that um, at, at a, excuse me, especially at a rate, at a, at, a, at a level that would cause us to abandon our public education, which is, I mean, in Milwaukee public schools, test scores are going up, you know, outcomes are, are, are better than they were. We have a, uh, our new superintendent who's doing a wonderful job right now and he's 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 proven himself and test scores are showing schools we're getting you know bad schools are are being handled appropriately and we are celebrating our success stories in, in public education and we still have schools who don't meet the same level of achievement as their public school counterparts yet receive the same amount of funding we have administrators so to say for some of these schools who bring in $140,000 to operate a school of 800 students when we have it, it, it's, it's become a, a profit venture it's, it's almost easier to open a school than to start a small business right right and, and that's the thing you know when you can make that amount of money our superintendent makes a, l a little more than some some of these administrators were, were with a system of eighty thousand people. So that's a hundred times as many students, maybe ten thousand more dollars a year. So you got, you got those are other things that have to be considered. It's like some people are just in it to make money. It's not about the education. So when they talk about greedy teachers, they point out some of these greedy <laughs> voucher administrators. So did you hear about this? I could show you. Yeah. From uh, yeah, there is. Yeah, and I and I mean, looking through my old my notes from from talking to these other people, yeah. Um, I mean, it's universal. Do people oh, okay. care about education? Do they care about a huge diversion from our community schools to fund an entirely new, untested district? And Representative Barnes pointed out that this is untested or. And that's the thing, it's, it's done on purpose. This is a system that's not new, it's not in its infancy, it's not even in its teenage years, it's in its 20s. Right. And yet they have not gotten to them to the point to be able to compare one towards the other. Um, so as it's ex expanding, it's, a, uh, it, it's not <coughs> as clear that, you know, that this is actually gonna be accountable because it hasn't been. And I mean, to, to switch the conversation to a larger one about education, um, we've seen the largest cuts in our state's history to our schools, K-12, community college, and to our tech, uh, tech schools and our universities. Um, we saw those and those, those cuts were largely not restored in this budget, so we we're still at historic lows. Um, and with the money that was saved, you are seeing that money divvied off to be able to go to people who are called the middle class. Um, by the governor and by the Republicans to say this is a middle class tax cut. And I don't know if you saw the, the paper uh, today that reported um, that half of it is going to be going for people making well over $100,000 for this tax cut. And the, the, biggest, the people who get the biggest break out of this is the people making $200,000 a year or more. Well, show of hands. How many... <laughs> How many of them are making 200000 or more? <laughs> Camera guy? <laughs> no, he's shaking his, he's shaking his head. Um, so, and we've, we've been all over the state. We've heard from hundreds of people. And we haven't had one person come out to us and say, yeah, that's, that's me. That's that the middle class. No, this is a dialogue. This is exactly. Yeah. He, he was able to, like, convincingly beat up on public school teachers. I mean, he combined that with his like, you know, vilify public employees and especially public school teachers. Yeah. And a lot of people around Wisconsin see that cut as a cut in, you 
you know, people who were overpaid and underworked. Mm -hmm. Now, this voucher system uh, move, isn't that going to shift the focus of faith from teachers to the, to the, to the, to the preservation of the institution of higher education? I mean, aren't, don't we see something? I mean, of course, a lot of what Parker does is pay back the kind of campaign contributions. And I'm sure Scott Jensen's organization you know, put a lot of money into this campaign. Yeah. And, and the people who want to national, you know, on a national level, want to destroy the public school system, you know, are, are probably, they have deep pockets. People, they, they get money from, from the people who own Walmart and people that, that you know, the people that initiated their own campaign. Yeah. Um, so some of that is, some of that is simple, simple pragmatic politics on this point. You can easily say that. It's like the 11.34 million dollars he got from uh, but aren't people aren't people going to see this now? It's not just a, a kind of a bad moment for teachers. This is a real attack on public education in this country. Yeah. In one sense, the the result is the same. You know, you're taking more and more resources from from the public schools, um, not just in teacher salary and benefits this time, but just actually the dollars are moving over to a secondary system. So the, the result is weakening the traditional public schools, which are left you know, with the burden of, of trying to educate everyone, not, uh, not those who choose to go there necessarily, but, the, but everyone. So I don't, I, don't see it as a, I don't see it as a remarkably different sort of um, priority that the governor has. I think that was his priority originally to um, to weaken uh, the public school uh, teachers union, which was his main um, opponent, uh, you know, in terms of uh, dollars and effort and all that. So he sort of accomplished that with the Act 10 and then, and then uh, moving over and another um, effort in the same area with vouchers. I, I was personally attacked by, the, by ads from All Children Matters that paid for by the DeVos family and by, I have been personally attacked and seen by ads paid for by the Walton uh, clan, you know, that were, which are very pro-voucher and uh, put, they put their money where their mouth is. They, they go after folks who are not particularly excited about vouchers. So I agree with your assessment on that, but I, I see it as sort of all one little march. You know, they started this thing by, by kind of moving income limits away from poor people. You know, and now they're trying to get the special ed vouchers. They're trying to, they're, every session that, that I was been in the legislature, which is, what, 14, 15 years, every session there's a new iteration of how we can get more resources into the voucher system from the public system. So it's a, it's a kind of a little march that they're doing here. Uh, but uh, I agree with your reading of it that there is, there is a just stark, Sort of political element to it. Um, I don't know if there's a, if the if there's a diff, much of a difference between attacking the, sort of the public school teachers and the the school system itself. But it's it's a, it's in the same direction. Whatever they've been doing. Concepts test that they've been using, but you know, taxpayers have demanded accountability on the schools. That's not just a Republican thing. That's been going on for years. So, the Department of Public Instruction initiated a, you know, a series of tests, and they're revise, revising that and trying to expand it into more of a of a guidance procedure 
Um, there's a whole suite of ACT tests that the, the state superintendent has um, been trying to get offered to kids in middle school and high school to help them with career guidance. What instrument your daughter is taking this next week, I don't know what's being administered. But um, it, is, it is a loss of instructional time. Some people say, well, yeah, and beyond that, maybe teachers are prepping kids for these, these tests and, and, and offering them um, special activities and practice testing and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of folks feel that we're a little test happy, but on the other side of it is you have citizens out there that want to get their, their money's worth, you know, and so you're going you're gonna to see some, for, some form of accountability testing. Now we have school by school report cards based on those kinds of scores. I think all of us agree that a certain amount of that is due to the taxpayers. And one of the reasons we get so mad about the vouchers is because if, if, you're, if you don't have a school board to go to and you don't have the full, fully disclosed results on what's going on in that school, why are we pushing so hard to make one side of the system accountable and not pushing this hard to make the other side of the system accountable? So. I feel for your daughter and her and the teachers and that that whole, you know, you only got 180 days to do it in and then you start taking four or five days a year for testing and it, it just seems to be a, a, a real bummer for kids and to try to keep continuity with instruction going. But a certain amount of testing is necessary so that the taxpayers can be assured that they're getting their dollars worth and that we can, we can just take a look at what's going on. and. Uh, Unfortunately, it takes time to do that. Yeah. What about, uh, Aaron, all this talk that the governor is projecting this Medicaid money and then he's going to take it? Um, what's going to happen with Badger Care? I'm hearing yeah. a lot about that. Do you have a question on that? No, I don't. No, we haven't heard anything about that. No. About Medicaid? <laughs> Medicaid. Um, question is about Medicaid and the Medicaid expansion and Badger Care and strengthening Badger Care and what that means. Do we have anybody on health? No, but I can talk to okay. some. Some. All right. Well, the, this is just came out in the, in the budget, so we're still finding out the uh, the details. But basically, um, what it does is Wisconsin over the last four years has uh, gotten to the point where they we had the second most number of our citizens covered by health insurance, second only to Massachusetts. And, and uh, what happened in this budget is, um, as you know, the governor uh, ardently resisted implementation of the Federal Affordable Care Act in Wisconsin. And in fact, it's turning it over to the feds um, and without Medicare and not and, and rejecting the Medicaid expansion if we had done it uh, here uh, in Wisconsin. What he's done is, is, a, is, is taking a huge gamble. He's reducing eligibility. I mean, what we did in, over the last four years under, actually it was before that, over the last six years, but mostly under Governor Doyle was to, um, in fact it was all under Governor Doyle, was to add childless adults to, um, to Badger Care. This was, a, this was the population that it was, that was, it was screaming out, was undercovered. People who were low income, who could not get insurance in the, on the private market because they were priced out of it. They had to compete on a, the basis of a single person applying instead of being part of a healthcare group. So, um, so what Badger Care did is um, uh, uh, get them enrolled in an in insurance, health insurance plan. They had to pay, had, it was subsidized. I mean, they were paying for it out of their pocket. Some of it was subsidized, but they got coverage. And what that did, and what that was so nice to the hospitals, is, is that these people could now go and get health care from a doctor instead of going to the emergency room. And the emergency room would cost, you know, $100, $200, $300 for, for uh, medical services that had been delayed because the person was holding off and holding off because they didn't have the money to pay for going to see a doctor. What the governor has done, is he's reduced the eligibility. So whereas before you had you, you were 200% of the federal poverty level in order to be eligible, now you're 100% of the federal poverty level. And 
Yeah, it's it, right. So well, it depends on the size of the family, but but it's like, uh, and the thing is, is that that range from the 200% to 100% is generally there's only about a third of that population that can actually afford to pay the premiums under Obamacare, and so they're going to because they just don't make enough money to be able to to do it. So there is going to be without the expansion of Medicaid a loss in in a the number of people covered and b in in federal money that would have come into the state of Wisconsin to fund that expansion of Medicaid for childless adults. Um, and I don't have the exact number. Let me see. Do you know the number? There's a a significant amount of federal dollars. And when they say federal dollars, I look at it as this is our tax money that, that we pay to the federal government that shouldn't be coming back to us. Just like, the, just like the transportation money, the rail money should have been coming back to us. This is money that we pay to the federal government that's not going to come back to Wisconsin. It's not going to help our citizens. It's going to go to someplace else. To me, it is really a disservice to the, to the, to the citizens, and that's in rough terms what's happening with cash care expansion. So I think the number you're looking for, Senator Miller, is sixty-six million dollars over that it? the term. Um, I could I could be wrong on that, <laughs> but it's um one hundred and seventy thousand. I have a, a six hundred and forty-four million dollar GPR inc uh, increase to from Medicaid from Medicare medical we'd, assistance. We'd be insuring over one hundred and seventy thousand more people in Wisconsin, and what this is going to do, as Senator Miller pointed out is we are going to have people dropping out of the insurance coverage because they can't pay the premiums with the changes that the governor um, is proposing, not taking the money from the feds. And we also keep hearing from our colleagues on the right that we want to be creating jobs. And we're, in essence, turning away over 10,000 jobs in health care, which is you know, premium jobs, as our, especially as our population ages. And we need to get more people working in the health care. So we're going to have a less insured population. We're going to be turning away jobs. And we're going to be turning away our tax dollars. And we have seen many examples of Governor Walker turning our tax dollars away. He turned our tax dollars away, if you all remember, with the, with the trains. And he also turned our tax dollars away with the internet expansion. And again, he's turning our own tax dollars away with health care, one of the basic rights that citizens of our state deserve. And this is egregious. It's a problem. These are not our middle class values. Um, there, um, that's a good question about who's actually benefiting from this. I, yeah, other states, other states will be getting the money. I, I that's a good question. I really don't know. Um, Insurance companies are generally in favor of what the governor is doing. The hospital association is against is against what the governor is doing. So the hospitals definitely. Don't view this as a benefit. Yeah, but this is um, to be clear. It's 1.8 billion in federal money over three years that would have been brought into the state, and that's 75 million in state general purpose revenue. And when it's general purpose revenue, that could be used for anything. Um, that could be used for your local schools. That could be used for local health care. It could be used for whatever. But the fact is, this is changing that because if we had accepted it. We would have been funded at 100%, 100% uh, of Medicaid and Badger Care Plus. Badger Care would be funded, but under this, it's going to continue to be 60% funded by the federal government. The other 40% comes from um, the state, and so that's where the 75 million that we would have saved comes from. Um, and it would have provided health care for all the people on the waiting list, people who are eligible already. 175,000 people who are on, uh, who are eligible for it, and would have reduced the uncompensated care by 250 million, as Senator Miller pointed out. This is money that actually comes off of people who are insured or people who visit the hospital and are able to pay their bills. Um, other people can't do that. They, they get to the emergency room, which is the, the least efficient type of health care we have instead of getting upfront care. Um, so this decision, it, it really, to put it in context, because we, we tend to focus on Wisconsin quite a bit, this is money that was taken by um, Rick Scott, conservative governor, Republican governor in Florida. Uh, John Kasich, Republican governor in Ohio, he used to be George W. Bush's budget director. Um, it was accepted by, right, the guy who passed right toward. Um, Jan Brewer, who is Arizona, um, the, the uh, anti-immigrant legislator.
legislation. I mean, she, they all accepted it. And they said, you know, on the grounds that, look, this is, uh, it's a humanitarian issue. These are people who would be funded, um, who we can end up taking care of. So the governor, you know, to be completely clear, he's put himself to the right ideologically than, than the most Tea Party of governors that we have in the country. Um, and if you Michigan, still- did they take money in, the in Michigan, yeah, he did yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and, and if you don't think this it affects you, it's, I don't think we have it on the chart, but 10,500 net new jobs that would have been benefited for the state of Wisconsin in expanding um, healthcare, um, healthcare access to our state. And I just wanted to um, make one thing clear because you, you the, the, the reasoning the governor gives for why he turned it down is saying the uncertainty about federal dollars. Um, he, they, they, I don't have the exact figure, but there's, it's in the billions, the amount of money that came to the state of Wisconsin from the federal government for different programs. And even in Arizona where they accepted it, they said if the match changes, we give ourselves the option to take, to kick, take it back and not do it anymore. So you can end it at any point in time. Um, so it's not a matter of all oh, the money will dry up and you'll be forced into this program. It's not the case. It's funded for the next 10 years. Um, so it's, it's extremely sad and it's extremely frustrating that the, the, the governor chose the ideological path instead of the um, humanitarian and, and frankly the path that most people in the middle class and most people thriving for the middle class um, would have taken and many would have expected him to take. So, um, you know, I just want to address Medicaid expansion, Badger Care. Okay. Um, any other questions or topics to hit on? Points of clarity? All right. Well, with that, we, just because we had the chart printed out, <laughs> we want to make sure that gets, uh, that gets used. So we have one more chart that we didn't hit. Um, and if you notice the, the, the clear discrepancy <laughs> from the top to the bottom, um, if you look all the way to the right, if you see where those numbers start out, that's when we started um, two years ago, when the governor started in office and was promising 250,000 jobs. Now, in that time, there was a lot of ideological bills that passed, a lot of ideological fights that he picked. And so because of that, we are at that bottom. So had we, that higher number, the number that looks good, um, you know, if you're skiing, that's where you'd want to start out. That number at the top there, that would be where we are if we kept pace with the federal rate of job um, production, job creation. So we would be up there. Instead, we have actually fallen behind in terms of all the other states where there's that 90,900 job gap, that discrepancy because our state has, has, has fallen behind because of these ideological pursuits. So we've ended up um, 42nd in the nation in terms of job create, creation and last of our Midwest states uh, in terms of job uh, creation. So we, um, we put forward many different proposals. We put forward the uh, middle class jobs now jobs package, which does some pretty, pretty simple, common things that I think most people can get around, like prioritizing Wisconsin companies when we're contracting as a state and making sure that they um, get a few extra points when we're, we're doing these contracts. And um, I don't know if any of you guys want to speak on this, but we had the press conference on a Thursday two weeks ago, and it was literally the next day that a contract was decided for a company um, called, Skyward. yeah, but it wasn't for Skyward, it was for a, a Minnesota company. Yeah. Right, Universal. right, right, Infinite Campus. Yeah, and it's, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, I'm really good. And it's other Steven's point on, on Frederick Hardwick show, that's that. Right. You know, right after. Ultimately, if the contract had been bid out in a way that we were honoring local control and jobs right. and an investment in our community, we would have seen that by giving it to a company that does a great job and provides the services to 50% of our school districts already, um, we would have been creating a huge number of more jobs. We would be following the values of our communities. And instead,
here we are shipping our jobs over to the other side of the Mississippi River. Um, that isn't the way things are done when we really want to be creating jobs. Again, it stinks as if there is um, some special interest favors being paid to organizations. And there's a lot of questions being asked right now. And um, you know, we really need to hold our governor and his colleagues accountable when it comes to what is important for our middle class. Do you think that's a reversible situation? The um, skyward? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's it unilateral, unilaterally changed. It was uh, done by the Department of Administration, which is the governor's yeah. arm. He could change it. Um, and they, they did appeal it. It seems that it has a lot of merit. Yeah, um, and this is, you know, this is 240 jobs, 240 people that they employ currently. Yeah, in the heart of our state, in, in, in uh, Stevens Point, in Wausau, um, they're actually looking to expand 600. Um, and so these are jobs, too. These are not um, minimum wage jobs. And we've all worked our, our share of minimum wage jobs. But these are actually good, high quality, $40,000 to $80,000 annually, annual paid jobs. And they were looking to expand. Um, they already have half the contracts of the state school um, school administration. Right. In my county, right. You know, Fifty to sixty thousand dollars to switch off. Right. Yeah. So they don't have, you know. Right. So I think it's you know to be to be completely clear, this is something where you know while we're trying to uh, appease out of state companies and try to lure them here, there's homegrown businesses uh, that we're we're just waving by to. If you saw the state of the state, and if you're a good public access watcher, you would have watched it. Um, the leadership, Democratic leadership, we each had these white pins on. You probably couldn't see what they were, but they each said skyward. Um, and they were pins, you know, to kind of point out, look, let's try and do something. It just makes sense to try and keep jobs for these people who are in an area that's, that's, that's trying to get some. Um, and Senator Lassa, uh, Democrat Julie Lassa, she, she gave a pin to the governor, but he Declined to wear it uh, that night, but this is we're trying to figure out what we can do, what we can in terms of our uh, our jobs plan. We we have another a, a number of different jobs proposals. You know, I take this kind of personally because I was the chair of finance when the when the recession hit us, the 2008 recession hit, and the revenue and look, there was some there was some concern that the whole national economy was going to fall apart. Um, we were confronted with a 6.6 .6 billion dollar deficit as a result of the, pulse of, the, of, the, of the economy. And we put into place the policies and the investments that we thought would create jobs. At the, et, when, at the end of that term, when, when Governor Walker took over in 2010, Wisconsin was approximately two percentage points better in terms of its unemployment rate. We were seven point something, and it, the national was, was, uh, was nine point something, 9.8, I believe. and. Um, and we were keeping pack pace with the national economy in terms of jobs created. As this chart shows here, the mm -hmm. first few months of the Walker administration showed that the, the, the momentum that we had built up was keeping pace with the national economy. Act 10 comes along and that's where that break occurs, right there. That's when the first of the budget adjustment bills happen. And then the regular budget. You can see the Republican policies do not work. You know, it was a struggle. It, you know, the governor, the governor claimed he, he balanced a $3.6 billion deficit compared to the 6.6 .6 one that we confronted. And we left him with a small, uh, positive, a small amount in his, in, in that, if, when that fiscal year was over. Over, uh, over $100 million was still uh, positive there. He, he claimed it was a $3.6 billion deficit, but that was comparable to the 6.6 .6 that his predecessor had. So those policies worked. Policies that the governor has proposed and the policies that proposed have, have de demonstrably not worked. We cannot afford to have that kind of performance in our state. We need, in order for us to be able to move forward on, on, on financing our schools, on building our roads, we need to have an economy that's recovering at least as good as the rest of the nation. And we have the manpower and the workforce to do better than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And so that's what our goal should be is not be satisfied for 42nd, we should be first or second or third. Absolutely. Let me just. I didn't mean that my high horse. No, 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 that's that's we, we all get on our high horses. Let me just make one little 
anecdotal comment on jobs creation. You know, we've all been watching this 250,000 job promise and it just hasn't come through. Sort of started two years ago with uh, trickle down tax cuts and big cuts in education. We thought that that was the wrong way to go. There is a feature in the governor's budget uh, that we just voted on in the Workforce Development Committee last week. It's called customized training grants. He's got about $15 million in there for partnerships with the technical schools especially. When employers need uh, their employees to have their skills upgraded or where there's seen to be a disconnect between the workforce and the jobs that need to be done, focus some dollars, train those workers and get them into those jobs. About $15 million. Um, there was bipartisan support for that this week. Right before the vote, I, I said, Mr. Chairman, I just have, I can't help myself, I have to make a comment that this is really what we should have done two years ago. Mm -hmm. Rather than the Act 10 stuff, rather than the trickle down theory on tax breaks, let's do something that really, really makes a difference in people's lives because it's an individual getting some training. In, in the long term for the state, because the technical system is strengthened and those, those courses develop where we really need somebody now and the economy kind of builds based on that training, why don't we do more of that? And I think that's the kind of thing that Democrats off, often have been speaking of and are very supportive of. The, the, the base of the educational system to the economy is so important. On the other side, we've been, we've been seeing things like, well, if you do these tax breaks, or if you give this little income tax break or whatever, it's gonna make a difference. Economists will look at the whole Wisconsin economy and how susceptible it is to national and interna international changes and all kinds of forces. And their conclusion is essentially, you know, Governor Walker, you can't make a big difference on this. State legislature, you can't make a huge difference on this. But with training grants and with f um, f strengthening our educational system, in the long run, we can position ourselves to be in better and better position. And that's where uh, the kind of direction that we think we ought to move. Any, anything else? Any other thoughts? Or Senator Jelf, who is, serves with me on that mining committee, has said repeatedly, the only jobs that are going to be created on this thing in the next 10 years are, are jobs for lawyers. Mm -hmm. well, because of the way that the, this entire set of environmental regulations is so drastically changed, it'll all be stuff that folks will go to court on, the environmentalists and the folks that want to do the mining. So you, instead of doing a mining permitting bill, which would have increased some certainty for applicants on mining, there were, there's this massive change in environmental law. So that creates just problems in itself. But the biggest problem with the mining bill is the arrogance of thinking that you can have this bill and shut out the Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. There's a federal process, which re Department of Interior, EPA, Corps of Engineers, which is not going to go any faster or any slower than it needs to on a mining permit. And one of their uh, groups that they support very strongly uh, in the case of the, the mine up north is the Bad River uh, Chippewa tribe. And they have their own environmental standards. They're in that watershed down from the Pinocchio Hills and they're going to be drastically affected. But to create a mining bill and to say we're going to do mining based on this bill and to just sort of blow off the Corps of Engineers and the whole situation, especially up in that very pristine, sensitive area, it just seems to me to be way beyond arrogance even. It's just disappointing. 
The other feature in that bill that's so disappointing is the lack of a, of a tonnage tax on that, or a, a tonnage. Minnesota has that. They've been operating mines successfully for years. Um, we believe that the net proceeds tax will essentially allow Gogebic Taconite, if they could ever get a permit, to not, not pay any kind of, of uh, sort of repayment to the citizens of Wisconsin, especially in the local area there. For extracting all these all these resources, so we just think it's unfair on the face of it, but we also think it's arrogant, in, in beyond arrogant. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Sure. So the concept behind it is, is we sell an asset and I'll get the cash, um, and then that'll help our financial situation in the state. But in order, we, the state's still going to need that power, so we're going to have to lease it back, pay more for it because there's going to be a profit built on top of it for whoever's generating instead of us generating for ourselves. Um, so it's sort of like selling your highways in some ways. You sell your highway and. Um, and then you expect that you're going to have a good highway all the way through because the, you're going to, the, the, the private company is going to keep it up. Um, I don't think so. Um, and the other thing that's concerning is, is that um, most likely purchasers are people who are energy producers or, uh, dare I say, a coal company producers that um, were signi are significant um, campaign contributors. And so there's some concerns. I mean, when there was talk about being able to sell it in the last budget with no mm. bids, you know, it just seems like the public was, if it, if it was the right decision, I don't think it is to sell off these assets because it's, it's, it's sort of like selling off your car. And how are you going to get to work when they rent a car? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the analogy I make. Yes, yeah, I mean, there is, absolutely. Um, I would say, if anything, there's more and more people who are stepping up and taking ownership of their, um, their vote, their community, of making sure that people are heard. Um, you have um, bookended at this table right now two brand new state reps. Um, one of them who is, I think, second youngest or third youngest, third youngest in the state assembly, and he's only 26. Um, and so, and you have, you know, Melissa Sargent, Representative Sargent, brand new in Dane County, mother of four, um, who was very active in the protest, got even more active and ran for office. Um, so you see these 14 in the assembly and there's one in the Senate and there's a lot of new blood. And I would also say that there's local officials who are running for office and getting elected. And I think more and more people are taking ownership of their state. And I always point back to a guy in Wisconsin history, um, Joe McCarthy, who's a U.S. Senator. Um, he, uh, he caused a lot of outcry in our state. It's important to remember history correctly. 
he had a lot of opposition. People knew that he was doing the Red Scare. You know, I hold the name of communists in my pocket, and I'm going to tell you who they are. Um, none of it was true. He scared the bejesus out of people. He was an embarrassment for our state. He still is an embarrassment to our state. Um, but he ran in the middle of that. He ran for re-election, and he won. And, but what ended up happening was there was a movement of people around the state who continued to be involved. And after he was out of office, those people were running. And those people then became leaders within our state and brought in an era of good government for the next yeah, two, exactly, Bill Proxmire, next two, three decades. So while it's frustrating now, I think when it's like a light switch, when people figure out what's going on with their state, it doesn't go back off. It's, hey, wait a second, why would he turn down these Medicaid funds? Why would he turn away access to affordable health care for so many people? Um, it's, you know, what, what people realized with the protests two years ago, exactly two years ago. Um, well, those people, people, people are still paying attention. Yeah. I didn't really, I'm not trying to get into that. No. Can you tell me about, like, a specific, like, is there a bill or is there, there's a bill that is there is I think one thing that we need to remember is that we have some fabulous things happening in Wisconsin. We have Tammy Baldwin. Um, we have local government that's turning progressive. We have, we have the majority of new freshmen in the assembly. We do have a majority somewhere. There's 11 new Republican freshmen in the assembly. There's 14 Democrats. So we may not have picked up a vast amount of numbers, but we are growing. And because we're there, and because we have new energy, and we have new vision, we are out across the state. This is not my district. I am not sitting in my district tonight. None of us are. We are traveling around the state because we care deeply, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that you all continue to be engaged, mm -hmm. don't get fatigued, don't feel totally frustrated, and motivate the people that are around us so that we can make change. We have a lot of work to do. We are not done. The Wisconsin way is rolling up our sleeves and shoveling the shit. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not going to mince words here. We have, we have stuff going on here that we should be ashamed of. But it is because of our passion and because of your passion and our values that we're going to be able to turn this around. So we do have fabulous things. I can't point to something in particular. Um, there are some bills that are going through actually on Thursday. Um, the assembly is going to be meeting, and there are two bills that are um, – Bipartisan jobs bills, jobs creating bills. Um, we are working together on some fronts. Now these are small steps, um, but half of the assembly has been there for two years or less. Half of the assembly, that is huge. If we're gonna change the culture of what is happening in that state capitol building, it's on the shoulders of us new folks. And we'll see what happens on Thursday. Bipartisan jobs bills, we'll see what happens. When I get a little depressed, um, I think of the ongoing services and people that I bump into repeatedly. When I visit schools and I see the really dedicated people, even though they're working, maybe they've given up a lot of a lot of salary and benefit in the last couple of years, but they're still working really hard. I was at a at a, an event a couple nights ago where where they had um, seven people from the DNR and Racine County talking about molybdenum. It's, in, it's a metal that gets in the wells. And they set up this wonderful forum where all the citizens could ask questions. They got um, treatment ideas and, and you know, contact folks. The DNR was, was there for them. You know? So you, you still have this ongoing service that's being provided under the budgets, whether they're Republican or Democrat. You still have the core services still going on. So I get encouraged by that. I think that um, the other thing that is, has been very encouraging from time to time is the courts. You know, the Republicans have gone after, you know, they talk about going after same-day voter registration and they run into a federal, you know, federal guideline on that. They talk, they talk about something else and the, and the circuit court judge says, whoa, hold, hold a minute. We still have operate under a system of law, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's in there yet. And even though we feel like we're being hammered a lot and the, the rules are sort of violated and stuff, yeah. we well, still so have that basis yeah. as, a, as citizens to have that basic rule of law that we're operating under. And we believe that 
it's our job to tell the truth. We're, we're all in the minority here. We don't control the government right mm -hmm. now. But it's our job to be out there talking the truth and to try to educate citizens and to, to try to try to build resistance to some of these more radical aberrations to the Wisconsin that we grew up in. You know, it doesn't, to me, I agree with you, it is a little depressing. You, know, you sound just like my wife. And, uh, but, it, but um, you know, we, we still live in a, a beautiful state, mm -hmm. a state where a lot of really good things are happening, a lot of, where government is still allowed to operate and, and do a lot for its citizens. So I, I try to look on the bright side. Mm -hmm. To your, to your point earlier about people just people waking up, people just understanding what's going on and w wanting to take part. Uh, myself, I was also part of a few of the protests, as was my staff person, which is ironic because, you know, the first day we walked into the Capitol, we could actually walk into an office that we worked in versus, <laughs> versus uh, you know, protesting. And we, we walked past a, a few doors and and, you know, he had some choice words <laughs> with maybe someone, uh, us, another staff person back when we were protesting. We was, you know, when, when, when tensions were at their highest. But it's, you know, it's just awakening a, 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 new, a new generation of, of, of leaders, people who are engaged who were not formally, formerly engaged. And they're going on with a, with, a, with a passion that a lot of people in the building may or may not have had. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank for coming. You. Yeah, spread the word, go forth, and <laughs> keep on doing this. And, and like Melissa said, we've only been, this is tab number five, and we're, you know, going out and making sure that people know that. Is this the same? Is this the same? No, oh, actually, no, it's, all different. no, it's, um, yeah, I think we had, in different ones, just so to give credit, we've had Senator Hansen come with us, we've had Senator Schilling, Representative uh, Steve Doyle, Representative Jill Billings, we've had Representative Dana Wax, we've had Representative Mandy Wright. Um, so yeah, we've had quite a few. And then uh, Representative Danny Reamer and Dave Senator, Reamer. Senator Dave Hansen have all come uh, yeah. along with us. So And then the next two stops, I know we're going to be doing Green Bay. And then we're looking, We yeah, we had it for Wednesday. We had to cancel it because they're jamming through this mining proposal. But we'll reschedule and make sure that the public is aware of the way that's going to and we'll be back. So, thank you all. Thank you very much.